Good evening. Testing one, two, three. There we go. It's good to see everybody tonight. We have more than I thought might be here with the weather going on. I was thinking about it. You know, we uh, could say, well, you know, I just want to stay home because tornado comes. I want to be at home. But then I started thinking, you know what? I could be just as safe or unsafe either place. Not that I was not going to come anyway, but uh, anyway, John chapter 4, it's good to see everybody tonight. We are still in the ministry of Christ and we'll probably be here for a long time. We're still in the book of John, as as I've explained the last couple of weeks, this is not a study on the book of John, it's just that John is the only one that records these early events, Uh, but now Jesus is going to be on his way to Galilee to start that great ministry up there, and uh, you remember... There in the recording of the book of John, uh, he performed the first miracle. What was that? That's right, water to wine. And uh, where did he do that? Cana, that's right. And then uh, he went on a little bit further. And what did he do next in his ministry, that early Judean ministry? He cleansed the temple. Cleansed the temple. And then from there... Uh, what did he do next? He had a conversation with somebody, that's what we talked about last week, with Nicodemus. Well now, he is going to be on his way leaving the Judea area, and he's going to be going up to Galilee to start that, but he goes through Samaria, and uh, says that he must needs go through Samaria. Well, he didn't have to go through there in order to get to um, Galilee. As a matter of fact, A lot of Jews would avoid Samaria altogether, but Jesus said it must go through there. And it's interesting, that wording there, and I think you'll see in here why he had to do that, why he felt that he needed to do that. But in John chapter 4, we have this account, and I don't know if we're going to be able to cover it all tonight, and um, especially the way I'm going to do it, I don't know that we'll actually get deep into some things um, that you might expect us to, but I want to maybe cover some things uh, that perhaps you've, you've never put together with this passage, and um, you know, it's interesting with this congregation, as educated as you all are in the Bible, you know, it's a challenge, okay, what am I going to do to teach these people anything new tonight? <laughs> uh, this is a count I know you've studied so many times in your life, but I want to look at a few things and uh, make some parallels, uh, give us some things to think about. But in John chapter 4, let's just start reading, read the first few verses. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. So that's where he's going now. But he needed to go through Samaria. That's what I was talking about. He needed to go through Samaria. You'll see in several places in the Scripture, and I think this is one of those places, where it says that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, uh, be persecuted and all those, and to die, then raise again the third day. Uh, when it says that he must go, well, did he have to go there? Because, well, you know what, I've got to, I've got, I've got to go there because I've got to... It was a divine must that drove him to Jerusalem. He must go there. Uh, and, and I think you'll see the same type of uh, reading in this. He needed to go through there, that divine must, to go and talk uh, to the Samaritans. And I think we'll bear that out as we go through. So he came, verse 5, to a city of Samaria, which was called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And in this, this is what the supposed well looks like today. And I say supposed um, Because, can it be 100% proven? I don't know. And I think there's a lot of things like that over there that um, are probably like that as you would go and travel, although I've never been. You know, they'll talk about this. But let me tell you how I think about a lot of that. I think a lot of that uh, is probably true. It was probably accurate. If I were over there and they took me on a tour and I saw this, I think I would believe that it is Jacob's well. Because it was so important for so many generations 
that would be talked about, even if it wasn't written about, it would be carried on from one generation to another. And we're going to show that tonight. This is not a well that was just popular in Jesus' time. This has been a well that's been popular for many times. And I think uh, I've mentioned to you before, it, when I was over in India, they have St. Andrew's Mountain, and they say that's where the Hindus uh, killed Andrew as he was doing work with the Hindus, the pagans in that area. And you know whether or not that's true, I, I can't say absolutely 100%, but you know it's carried on through generations. So you can believe it if you want or not believe it if you want. doesn't make any difference anyway. But that's what it looks like today. And from what I've, told, what I've been told, you go to these places and it's kind of like Disneyland. There's a gift shop at every exit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can go to Jacob's Well. Uh, but supposedly that's what it looks like today. <clears throat> now, I want us to see something. I'm going to read through the first several verses. And this is what I want us to notice. I like to do this with John chapter 9. If you look at the progression of faith in John chapter 9 of the man that was born blind, uh, when they ask him, you know, who did this? I don't know, some man named Jesus. Um, and then he goes on and progresses. Well, as they were debating whether or not he was a man of God, the blind man states, uh, I, I think he's a prophet. And so he goes on until, what does he say at the very end of that account? Do you remember? That's right. He is the Messiah. And he bows and, and he worships him. And you see something similar to that with the Samaritan woman in the book of John chapter 4. Verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of, the, of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I want us to notice in this, and you can be looking for this as we study this tonight, that at first the woman sees Jesus as a Jew. That's the first thing she notices about him. Uh, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, being a Samaritan? Then drop down to verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? So that's the question she asks. Are you greater than... Than Jacob, And I don't think that is a sarcastic question. Uh, she's progressing. And then look at chapter 4, verse 19. It says, The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then, go down to verse 26. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Uh, she just said in the previous verse, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus reveals who he was. Has he done that often so far in his ministry? Has he claimed his deity, that he is the Messiah, in a very public way? So what is it about this woman who gets to be in on this beautiful fact that she is talking with the Messiah? So be looking for that. And then you drop down to verse 30 and watch what she does. Then uh, they went out of the city and came to him. Well, verse 29 rather. Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? She invites the villagers to come and see. And then their declaration at the very end, verse 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So you see how it goes from, hey, you're a Jew. And then it progresses. Are you greater than Jacob? I think you're a prophet. We know the Messiah is coming, and you're, you're kind of freaking me out a little bit. <laughs> could, could you be that one? And he said, I am. I who speak to you am he. Then she goes and tells people. You, so you see her progression uh, in her faith. So notice that, first of all, and then notice something else as we continue our reading. Uh, verse 8, For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get the living water? 
Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I might not thirst, nor come here to draw. Have you ever carried buckets of water? You know, we have five-gallon buckets that we carry that come with a handy-dandy handle. And that makes it a lot easy. But you know what? They're still heavy. <laughs> now imagine carrying a big pot to draw. and Maybe they had a sling on it so they could carry it over their shoulder or something. I don't know. But what do you do when you carry one five-gallon bucket of water? What's the other arm do? <laughs> yeah, you ever notice that? <laughs> and so you like to carry two, and so it kind of evens things out. Now... Imagine this woman doing this. Give me this water, number one, so I'll never be thirsty again. And number two, I don't have to come and do this job every single day. Give me this water. That's right. That's right. Um, and so then, verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. That's when she says, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Let's stop right there and consider a couple of things. Look at the end of verse 6. Notice what time it was. What, what does that say? It was about the what hour? The sixth hour. So how did the Jews tell time? That's right. Six o'clock starts the day, so the sixth hour of the day would be what time? Twelve o'clock. Twelve o'clock is one of the hotter parts of the day, isn't it? Wouldn't be the ideal time to go and get water. And we're going to see that this was, this was out of the ordinary, that she was even doing this. And so Jesus is on this journey from Judea to Galilee, and he passes through, he's tired, he sits down by a well. The disciples go and get uh, some something to eat. They're going to come back. And while they're gone, here comes this woman. And it was about the sixth hour. And here's something I wanted us to do tonight. And I thought this was interesting. Hoping, hope you will too. It reminds us of some other accounts, perhaps that we're familiar with in the Old Testament. And they are the mission of Abraham's servant, charged with looking for a wife for Isaac. And then... Uh, the encounter of Jacob and Rachel in Genesis chapter 29, and the flight of Moses to the country of Midian and his meeting with the seven daughters of Jethro, the priest. And in these narratives, and we're going to just read a little bit of this, look over to Genesis chapter 24. We're going to see some similarities in this, but we'll learn a little bit about what was so unusual that this woman was there at, at noon, our time? In Genesis chapter 24, uh, Abraham, as we read Sunday night in our study, he is getting old, he wants to find a wife for his son, doesn't want to get one from there, he wants to get one um, from his people. So he sends his servant, you know, they, they make that vow, I'll go and go and find and you know, how am I going to uh, determine this? Look at verse 8. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath, only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten ma of the master's camels and departed, for all of his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time watch the time when women go out to draw water what time did the women go out to draw water at least in this occasion at this time at this point in history what time was the normal time and what does it say in the evening when the women go out to draw water notice a couple things what time was it it was the evening and what gender was the ones that went out and get, got the water? I like that, don't you men? <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble, so I'll just stop and leave that right there. Go out and draw the water. 
And then watch what he does, verse 12. Then the Lord, then he said, O Lord God my master Ab of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Why do you think he chose the well? Why, why stop there, let your camels rest? Why, why a well? Not that he's thirsty. That's where the women are coming from. And what's he looking for? A wife. A wife. That's right. And so that would be the logical place to go. I don't know where that would be today. I don't know. Maybe well, I'm not going to say that either. <laughs> I'll stop right there. I don't want to get in trouble tonight. Where would you go if you were looking for women? I was going to say the beauty shop, but I'm not going to say that because I don't know. The mall? Yeah, the mall. Those are almost dead and gone anymore, aren't they? Yeah. But wherever we would go, this is why he goes there. Uh, verse 13, he says, Behold, I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, Please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, Drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And it happened before he had finished speaking. And we know the rest of this account, but I want you to notice something. He's going to go there to the place where the women would be coming. And he does it at the right time of the day. And he asks God, let it be this way. Whichever one I ask for a drink, she says, hey, not only for you, let me water your camels as well. Uh, what would that be showing? Kindness, hospitality, kindness, sweetness. And so, of course, we know what happens with that. But notice that, and then turn with me to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis 29. <clears throat> this is the encounter of Jacob and Rachel. So where did Jacob's daddy find a wife? At a well. And now look at Jake, uh, Jacob himself. Genesis 29, starting with verse 1. Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and he saw a well in the field. And behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there. And they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, put the stone back in its place. Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. And he said, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. So he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. With the sheep. Then he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together. They have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then, the water, then we water the sheep. Now while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she was a shepherdess, and it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was his father's relative. So in this case, who did the watering? Jacob did that for her. What does that show about Jacob? He's kind and helpful. She went back and tells her dad, and notice again, there was a marriage that took place because of this episode as well. Now go over to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. This is after Moses had slain an Egyptian for slaying one of his, uh, for beating one of his kinsmen. And so he flees out of Egypt. And watch what he does, verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Sat down by a well. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. A kindness again. And so then their father-in-law, Jethro, Raul, their father, he said, 
um, how is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So he said to his daughters, and where is he? And comes, they feed him, lodge him, and he ends up marrying one of his daughters, one of Jethro's uh, daughters. A marriage resulted from that. But I want you to notice in those three episodes, there's a lot of similarities, but there's one glaring difference. The first one, they gave him drink. Let me not just give you something to drink, let me give your camel something to drink. The other two, the men took the initiative. They were going to do the watering. They were going to draw from the well. But we go back to Genesis or to John chapter 4, what kind of reception did the Samaritan woman give to Jesus? Give me a drink. And what does she say? Why are you asking me, a Jewish man, asking me, a Samaritan, to give you something to drink? So did she do it? No, she didn't do it. There's a big difference there. But notice this as well. These three narratives, one or more women came to the well, a conversation ensued from that place, either the man asked for water, or it is he who at the end of the account offers or gives water to the herd entrusted to the young woman or women, then the young woman runs home, tells how she met a man near the well, and the man receives an invitation from the parents of the young woman who generally offer them a meal. Finally, the story ends with marriage. You have Isaac and Rebekah in Genesis 24, Jacob and Rachel and Leah in Genesis 29, and then Moses and Zipporah in Exodus chapter 2. The woman who came to the well is the future wife in these other accounts. But John 4 ends a little bit differently, doesn't it? There's a lot of similarities. That's exactly right. <laughs> She's not needing another man, is she? Yeah, she was living with one at that time. But it does get our attention on some of the things. I want you to notice, again, these similarities. Those women would run back home, tell of this, and there would be a great reception. What did the Samaritan woman do after she perceived that he might not just be a prophet, he might be the Messiah? What did she do? She went and told all the men of the city and they came out and they talked with him and then they knew, we know that you are, not because of what she said, but because we've met you and, and we've talked with you and we know. But the sixth hour, so here's the question and I'm sure you've probably uh, heard this before and, and might know the answer, but why do you think if the women generally came out the cooler part of the day towards the evening to water the, to get water, why do you suppose that this woman came out at noon? Say it again. She was an outcast. I think that's right, and I think there's some good indications of that even in the text. So she came at the evening time when women go out to draw water, and a lot of times they would do this together. And it would kind of be a social gathering where they would go out and do this chore together. You know, back, and this is before my time, <clears throat> but uh, my father-in-law would tell me that, you know, up there in Indiana, in, in the area of where we lived, uh, maybe one guy might have a hay cutter, and another guy might have a hay baler, and each one would have different, one guy might even have a tractor, and that was, that was highfalutin, you know. Yeah. But what they would do is they would all work together. and They'd go from farm to farm and cut hay, bale it, stack it, and all of that. And I guess that used to be done. But he was telling me about some of the times that they had together and the joy. Has anybody ever here ever baled hay in the summer? It's about as fun as getting shot. Especially up in the hay mow when it's 100 and whatever degrees it is. And then that hay gets all over you. We're not talking straw, we're talking hay. And, oh, it's horrible. But, if you can make that more enjoyable in any way, that would be a plus. 
And so the women would go out there and they would do this oftentimes together. So not only did she go at noon, she went alone because of the other women who were going to come in the evening. And so what can we surmise by that? Well, there was probably a reason that she came there alone. He says, give me a drink. And we've talked about this. And we also drew some parallels in this that, that the um, reception was usually very good. But, but she says, why are you asking me for a drink? Being a Jew who have no dealings with the Samaritans. So that was rather abrupt, it seems. But then watch. Verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you a living water. The woman says to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? How are you going to get down there deep? Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and he drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I might not thirst nor come here to draw. And then watch how Jesus answers her. And I think that this is a good indication perhaps of why this woman came at noon and why Jesus sat down at that well. Did Jesus know this woman's background? Did he know this woman before she ever opened her mouth? John's already told us a few times in the book of John that he knew what was in men's hearts, didn't he? And so what is he going to do? Watch what he does. Go call your husband and come here. You think Jesus knew her marital situation? Well, we know that he does. He's getting ready to prove that. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. True or false? Well, <laughs> Jesus says, yeah, you're speaking the truth. And let me tell you why. You have well said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. A couple things here. This woman... Especially in that day and age, I mean, you hear about this occasionally even today, but especially in that day and age, uh, had five husbands, the one that you're living with now is not your husband. That might be a good indication of why she's there in the middle of the day. And we show Christian kindness and we want to, you know, love and show kindness to everybody and, and I'm going to trap you, but I don't mean to. <laughs> but you base a natural instinct. Would this be the type of woman that you would want to spend time with? No. Ladies, is this the type of woman that you would like your husband to be around? Would you like to invite this woman into your house with your husband there? But our Lord deals with her. But I want you to notice how he deals with her. Did he kind of dance around the issue? You know, this woman's here at noon. She's there all by herself. Jesus knows. She knows why she's there by herself. And so where does Jesus hit? He hits right at the root of this woman's problem, doesn't he? He hits right at the root of her problem. He went right to the heart of the matter. Here's the thing, and don't answer this out loud. But when something is amiss in our life, especially when we know better, do you dwell on that personally? You don't have to answer. Let me answer for you. Yes. You know it. And if you are in an unrepentant state at that time, you're trying to keep everybody else from knowing it. But then, in your life, 
when there may have been a situation like that where you have been participating in a particular sin, you've been trying to hide it from others, and you're so careful to make sure that nobody ever finds this out. You don't talk about it. You don't bring it up. You hope nobody else brings it up. But then when it finally comes out, There's almost a flow of emotion and I'm glad that you're holding me to this. A good person does that anyway. And so, he brings this up to her. Do you think he did that to hurt this woman? To just point out and say, psh, yeah, you say you have no husband. You're right, because you've had five. And the one you're with now is not your husband. Do you think he did this to hurt this woman, or do you think he's trying to get to the root of the matter to get this woman to get her life right? And I think there's a lesson to be learned here. As difficult as it is, and, and let me tell you, I'm talking to myself. As difficult as it is sometimes to say the things that need to be said, because that's awkward, nobody likes confrontation, and if you do like it, then there's probably something wrong with, with that. But there's a necessity to get down to the root of the problem. I had some experience doing marriage counseling, and, and not the best at it, but I do know one thing. You have a man and woman together they'll talk he never does this she never does this he always does this she always does this and you can talk about all these things out here that are symptoms of the problem but until you get to the problem it's hard to help repair that marriage That's a good question. I wonder. I don't know. Um, I would have some guesses, but I don't know. No. And you know what? When you know better, you can never be happy there, can you? We, we, we try to convince ourselves that we're happy, convince other people that we're happy. But when you finally take that first step, okay, now somebody else knows that's going to be the help I need to do something. It's almost you're on the road and it's such a freeing feeling in, in some ways. But So he gets right down to it and it leads to the advancement in her understanding. What does she say after he says that? What's it say? I think you might be a prophet. <laughs> How did you know that? You're a stranger in this town. You've never been here before. Uh, I think you are a prophet. Then she gets into uh, this question, verses 20 through 24. And this is a good question to ask a prophet. And again, I don't think she's being ugly here. Um, when she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. What, what is it? I might have a prophet here, so let me ask this a very good question. And again, he reveals to this woman some things he hadn't taught other people yet. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Remember the Samaritans, they just followed the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. And so they would have missed out on what the prophets wrote, what the prophets said about Jesus, uh, and all of these things that would have really helped her in a lot of ways. We worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. 
The woman said to him, now watch her response based on what he just said. I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Right, I am he. They had been worshiping at this time the things that represent what is coming. But Jesus says, it's getting ready to get real. The disciples come back. We're out of time. Um, I should have been clicking through all of that. The disciples come back, and they marvel that he talked with the woman. And I love this thing said just in passing. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come and see. What was the only reason she went to the well? In the middle of the day, by herself. Get water. And where did she leave the water pot? There was something that interested her more than that. Come see a man. Then Jesus talks with the disciples and teaches an awesome lesson. The fields are already widened to harvest. Look at these Samaritans. And then verse 42 and, and this, is, this is real faith. Look at this, then we'll close. When she told the men, they said to the, wom- they said to the woman, after they had had time to interact with Jesus, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Those were believing. And I tell you something, That's where our faith needs to be. Not because the preacher said it. Not because my mom and dad said it. Not because my wife tells me what to believe. But because I read and studied and know Jesus. And that's why I'm going to follow Him. It's an awesome account. Sorry we had to speed through it, but that's what Wednesday nights are all about. Racing, it seems.